to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Good and upright is the Lord. Psalm 25, verse number 8. We welcome you today to our study of our awesome God. In this series of lessons, we're thinking about the God that we serve, His nature, His characteristics, and, and what it is that He gives His children that is so amazing and so awesome. And so we're so glad that you joined us today for our study. We hope that you've got your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, we want to encourage you to locate it, get it ready, as we're going to look to the Word of God together in our study of our awesome God. Today in particular, we're thinking about His wonderful salvation that God makes available. And so we encourage you to have your Bible, have it handy as we're going to look together. Today's lesson, as always, is being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Uh, you'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about the truth, and who more than anything want men and women to go to heaven. And so stop by and visit the Church of Christ in your area. We'd love to encourage you to do that. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in your study, in your journey to know God better. Uh, check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material. We have video lessons, audio lessons, written material, study questions, just a wide variety of good Bible study material, and it's all available to you free of charge. You can access it anytime. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our over 500 lessons, we'd love to make those available to you free of charge as well. Just check out our website. You can go to our media request form. You can receive a digital download instantaneously. Or if you need a DVD or CD, we'd be glad to make that available to you free of charge as well. And friend, in our fast-paced world, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app available on the Android and Play stores. Android and Apple stores there. Uh, be a great way to study the Word of God in our fast-paced world. Today we're thinking about our awesome God and His wonderful salvation. And friend, I want you to know from the outset, I want each of us to know and be reminded how wonderful our awesome God's salvation is. Think about the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter 8, about verses 37 through 41, Philip teaches the Ethiopian eunuch the gospel. That man is baptized into Jesus Christ. And in Acts 8, verses 39 through 41, the Bible tells us he went on his way rejoicing. Here's a man who was coming to Jerusalem to hear about, uh, to worship, and he heard about Jesus, and he saw the evidence, and, and he read about him in Isaiah 53 in the scroll, and he learns the gospel, and his life is completely changed, and he leaves rejoicing in our awesome God and his wonderful salvation. And friend, for every Christian today, I want you to think about the benefits and blessings of that salvation. Paul would say in Philippians 4 verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. What's great about this wonderful salvation? Friend, we have joy that transcends culture, that transcends circumstances, that, that, that transcends this old world and points us toward heaven itself. Do you remember the words of the psalmist in Psalm 1 verse 1? Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but happy is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he does meditate day and night. The really happy life is found in God and His salvation. Let me give you another classic example. 
Acts chapter 16, verse number 25 says, Paul and Silas were praying in prison. They were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. How is it that Paul and Silas were praying and worshiping God and singing and making such an impact on the prisoners of that day? Because God's salvation made all of that possible for them. Matthew 1 verses 19 through 21 says of Jesus, you'll call his name Jesus, you'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. He'll save his people from their sins. And so the salvation and the hope we have, friend, that's what makes this salvation so wonderful. And as we think about this salvation, which is so amazing, it's a part of our amazing God's blessings to His children, let's consider for just a moment, what does it mean to be saved? What are we saved from? The idea of saved indicates or implies that we are taken or removed from something negative. We're, we're taken out of something bad, maybe. We're put in a better situation. And so consider what it is that we're saved from. First, we are saved from sin and its consequences. If you're of an accountable age, like it or not, all of us have to deal with the sin problem. Romans 3 verse 23 says, the Bible clearly teaches us there that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Listen to that, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 10 makes it even more graphic. There is none righteous, no, not one. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 26 following, there's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. And so all of us have broken God's law. We've sinned, we've transgressed, we've missed the mark. And because of that, there are consequences to our sin. What are those consequences? Romans 6, 23 puts it first in the positive. The Bible tells us, the, the, or in the negative, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen to that consequence. The wages of sin is death. What are we talking about? Spiritual death. The soul who sins will surely die. Death from sin is a spiritual death of the soul in which we are separated from Almighty God. The Bible teaches in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 that the Lord's ear is not heavy. God doesn't need to hear it. Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. God doesn't need a hearing aid. His arm's not shortened that he, God doesn't have a defect where he can't reach out and save you. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. And so we're talking about sin and the consequence being spiritual death. Uh, the Bible teaches in Mark 9 verse 44 that hell is a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And we think about that rich man in Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31. He went to that place of torment. Just one drop of water. I'm tormented in these flames. He was in unbearable agony and pain. Friend, li listen carefully. I understand nobody likes to hear about sin and the consequences, but here's the good news. When you're saved, by our God, His, our amazing God and His wonderful salvation, that's what you're saved from. You're saved from sin and the consequences of destruction. Secondly, a person is saved from his self and selfish interest. You know, whether we like to admit it or not, sometimes we are a very selfish people. We think about me and mine and I and what I want and my needs and, and without Christ and the gospel and God in our life, sometimes we're very selfish. Friend, the good news is when I'm saved, I learn to be saved from self to a higher calling to serve God. There's a way that seems right to a man, but that end is the way of death. Just focusing on man, his interest, his goals, his selfish desires, that's not the right way. You see, God said in Isaiah, God calls us to a higher way. Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 11, God said, My ways are not your ways, nor are your thoughts my thoughts. As the, uh, God says, My ways are higher than your thoughts. God's way is a higher, 
a, a greater way of being called and living in this life. And so I'm saved from self in that life's no longer about me and my selfish interest. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 reminds us what life is now about. Solomon said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's life all about? Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Uh, a lawyer asked Jesus in Mark chapter 12, verse 30 following, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus gave him a twofer on this one. He said, the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, like unto it is, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. Make sure that I'm living a life where I can go to heaven. Friend, that saves me. I want you to think about all the people in this life who everything is about them who life is about their interest, who if things go just a little wrong, the whole world is turned upside down. The Christian doesn't live that type of life. Thirdly, when we think about what it is we're saved from, friend, I'm saved from this old world and its ultimate demise. The Bible teaches in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but it's of the evil one or the wicked one. And the world, listen to this, and the world and all that's in it is passing away. But he who does the will of God shall abide forever. This world with its foolish, selfish interest, one day it's all going to be destroyed. But the one who does God's will, the Christian, he's saved from that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, puts it in such a, a graphic picture. If in this life only we have hope, we are the most pitiable of all people. Friend, if my whole existence is just here, how pitiful. Just this world, what a pitiful existence that is. And thus the Christian can say, he who is in you, he who is in the Christian, is greater than he who is in the world. And then, of course, I'm saved from the stranglehold. I'm saved from the evil that Satan wants to ultimately do to all people. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he made of ours. He's actively, aggressively looking for people to destroy. Think about Peter, Luke 22, verse 31. Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Think about what he did to Job in Job 1 and 2. His wealth, his family, his health, his friends come and they are no comforters at all. All of that, everything that happened to Job was a direct result of Satan. Now friend, we are not saying that there are not going to be problems. We are not saying that there are not going to be sickness and death and disease and calamity and maybe even loss of wealth. But here's what we are saying. Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end. The Bible says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4 and Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And so for the child of God, God's going to take care of his own. Satan cannot, unless we allow him, Satan cannot have his way with God's children. Now, friend, as we consider today our amazing God and his wonderful salvation, maybe you're sitting back thinking that, that it, God is amazing and his salvation is indeed wonderful. Are you saved? Are you in the group of the say? Are you a recipient of that salvation by the grace and mercy of God? Friend, what we're asking today is, have you done what the Bible says a person must do to be saved? The greatest question that has ever been asked for all time and eternity is found in Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's consider that idea for just a moment as we consider God's salvation. And friend, I want you to think honestly. I want you to look into your own life and I want you to answer according to the Bible whether you've done these things or not. 
To be saved, there's not only things you've got to do, but the Bible teaches you've got to know certain things as well. John 8, verse 32, Jesus said, You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Well, what must I know before I'm ready to be saved? A friend, as we've mentioned, to be saved, you've got to know you're lost in sin. Again, the Bible teaches there's none righteous, no, not one. To be saved, not only do you have to realize outside of Christ, I am lost in sin, but you've got to realize you can't save yourself. Man thinks he can do all kinds of things. We have made technological advancements. We have made industrial advancements. We've made mechanical and scientific advancements. Man still cannot save himself. Jeremiah said in the long ago, in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Paul said salvation is in Jesus, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 10. And then, friend, you've got to know, only our amazing God can save us. He's the only one. If I'm saved... It's by the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, by grace are you saved. If I'm saved, it's by the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel is God's power to save. Romans 1, verse 16, if I'm saved, it is by obedience to the will of God. Jesus said it's not everybody that just looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does... The will of my Father in heaven. And friend, if I'm saved, I'm going to be in the place of the saved where God puts us in His church. Acts 2 verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so, do you recognize that without Christ, you're lost in sin? Do you realize you can't save yourself and that you've got to turn to our amazing God for His wonderful salvation? Friend, if that's the case, then maybe you're honestly asking today, what do I need to do to be saved? Maybe you feel the weight and the burden of sin. Maybe you recognize your life is not what it ought to be because you don't have Christ in it. A friend, if that's what you're asking today, let's turn our attention to what the Bible says a person must do to be saved. Remember the great question, Acts 16 verse 30, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's let the Bible tell us. To be saved, the Bible teaches you've got to hear God's Word. That means I, I have to listen to and tune my heart to the message of Jesus Christ. I, I know hearing the Word of God is essential because faith is essential, right? Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to Him must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now stay with me for just a moment. Faith is absolutely essential to salvation. We just heard that, right? Everybody recognizes to be saved, you've got to have faith in Jesus. A well, friend, if faith is essential, would you not agree whatever way you get faith is also essential? You get faith by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17, notice this verse. The Bible says, faith, comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your heart. Psalm 95, verse number 7. And so, to have faith, to even believe in Jesus, I have got to attune my heart to the Word of God and make up my mind. I'm going to listen and do what it says. And so, when we talk about hearing the Word of God, here's what that means. Hearing God's Word means You've got to recognize this book, the Bible. You've got to recognize what we have right here today. The Bible, the Word of God, is God's final authority. It is the absolute authority on all matters of salvation. You see, Mark 9, verse 7, Jesus went up on that Mount of Transfiguration. He's transfigured there before Peter, Andrew, and John, and uh, Moses and Elijah up here, and Peter, because he doesn't know what to say, he blurts out, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And before he even got the words finished out of his mouth, before that sentence was even finished, a voice from heaven but came booming down, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear Him. Friend, if I'm going to hear the Word of God, that means I recognize the voice of God, the Bible, Jesus' words 
are the words of salvation. It means I'm going to study for myself to make sure what I'm doing is true to the Word of God. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. To be saved, as we've already mentioned, you've got to have faith or believe in Jesus. Listen to Christ's words in John chapter 8, verse 24. Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. Must a person have faith in Jesus as the Savior of the world to be saved? Absolutely. Uh, think about Acts chapter 8. We mentioned at the outset about the wonderful salvation that the Ethiopian eunuch received. He, here's the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's been, uh, Philip's been teaching him the gospel, and he gets the point. Here's water. What hinders me? Listen to the hindrance. If you believe with all your heart, you may. Acts chapter 8, verse number 37. Now, friend, we emphasize and we clearly teach from the Bible that belief, faith in Jesus is essential, but the Bible doesn't teach faith only saves. That's a demonic doctrine. James 2, verse 24, the Bible says, We see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. The only time in the Bible faith alone or faith only is mentioned, the Scripture says it alone will not save. Listen to the illustration. You believe there's one God, you do well. Good for you. Even the demons believe and tremble. A mental ascent Belief only that puts no action or effort forth is a demonic salvation and it will put you right where the demons are on the front row in the halls of hell. That's not a salvation that's going to save. And so you've got to have the, the type of belief that leads you to do what God says, which leads us to the third step in God's plan of salvation. The Bible teaches to be saved a person must repent. That is, I've got to change my way of thinking and I've got to change my way of acting. Luke 13, verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Acts 2, verse 38, the first time the gospel is preached, Peter said, Repent. That was a, one of the first words out of his mouth when it came to the climax. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repent and turn again or be converted. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Now, friend, when we talk about repentance, I want you to realize that repentance includes sorrow, but it's not sorrow alone. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says this, Godly sorrow produces repentance. It does not say godly sorrow is repentance. You can cry all the tears you want, but if you don't change your life, you've really not repented. True repentance brings forth fruit. Luke chapter 3, verse 8, some came out to be baptized by John. They were doing it because everybody else was doing it, and John said these words, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. A changed way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting is what repentance is. Now, again, don't misunderstand here as well. We are not saying 100% perfection the rest of your life and you can never mess up. All of us from all of us mess up, but I'm trying. I've made up my mind. I'm going to do the best I can. That doesn't mean that I won't slip or fall, but I'm going to get back up and I'm going to try to do it again to the best of my ability. And then, friend, the Bible teaches to be saved, you must confess Jesus as Lord in Christ. Romans 10 verse 10 says, with the heart, the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, Confession is made unto salvation. We've got to confess what Jesus said. If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And having made that good confession, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8 verse 36 following. The Bible teaches there's one more step. Friend, to be saved, the Scriptures teach one must be baptized for the remission of sins. In our world today, there's a lot of confusion about baptism. Some people say baptism is just an outward expression that you're already saved. Baptism is not essential to salvation, something good to do, something that Jesus did, but you're saved before you're baptized. Friend, all I ask you today is to get your Bible and consider these ideas with me. The Bible teaches that baptism is not something done after you're already saved. It's something done 
to be saved. That's what the Word of God says. Mark 16, 16. Listen to the words of Jesus. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. If you don't believe, you're not a candidate to be baptized. But if I believe, what must I do? He that believes, watch it now, and is baptized will be saved. In that verse, salvation does not come before baptism. Peter said similar, Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. When are sins forgiven? Whenever sins are forgiven, that's when a person's saved after baptism. Acts 22 verse 16, Saul of Tarsus is told by Ananias, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Sin separates a man from God. If I can know when my sins are removed, I can know when I'm back with God and saved, right? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. But here's one of the clearest of all. Peter said in 1 Peter 3 21, baptism does now also save us. You see, friend, baptism is when God says we contact the blood of His Son. We're baptized into His death. I'm saved by the death. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. I'm saved by His sacrifice. And the Bible teaches I contact that. I am baptized into His death. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And so here's what we ask you to consider today. Our God is so amazing. We serve an amazing God that words really can't even begin to describe. His salvation is such a wonderful part of God's nature. Have you been saved? Do you have the blood of Jesus applied to your spirit? Have you become a Christian? Friend, if you haven't, then we're begging you today, in view of how good God is and how great His salvation is, won't you become a child of God? Don't let anything get in the way. Put everything to the side. Make it priority number one, and you'll see for yourself how good our God is. Join us next time as we study more about our amazing God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the